Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Don't say Mr. Holmes. It's Mr. Factor. Yeah. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the questionnaire, right? Right? And today, man, today we're going to get a little unlimited with things. Yeah. With Philip Sevy and Zach Thompson in the house. Hi. <laughs> Y'all are supposed to say hi. I guess it's like, I guess it's like, I guess it's like, dude, this hip hop artist gives a very hip hop intro to people that are in there. They're like, they're like, I kind of threw me in the fuck. Because I'll come to the conclusion, I've thrown a lot of creators off with that. I apologize. I don't mean to. I am who I am, and I just can't bloody well help myself. But Zach, Philip, thank you for coming off the show. Right off the bat, man, I appreciate y'all for it. And like I said, we are going to get a little unlimited, but we'll get into that in a moment, right? Um, man, y'all gave some pretty good answers. Like, I appreciate it. We'll get into that in a moment as well. But I kind of just want to dive into what we were discussing right before I did what I just did, which is <laughs> comicology. Um, now, how long ago did that start? Do either of y'all know? Yeah, I like, say, uh, Amazon acquired Comixology maybe three years ago. Does that sound about right? I'd have to do some Googling, but it's been <laughs> a couple of years. Yeah. So, and and I mean, look, I'm, I'm going to in general say that when Amazon acquires something, it's probably not good for what that something is. <laughs> no. I say that as someone that's listed on uh, Amazon Podcasts, and you can straight up find us on Amazon to listen to as the questionnaire. So maybe I should shut up before Jeff Bezos is like, take that <laughs> damn show off, man. All right. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? But um, I'm curious, Phil, man, you said that you went from buying comics weekly to just buying none on there. What was yeah. it about the switch that caused that in you as far as just to stop purchasing from the, from the provider? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the biggest changes about a year, year and a half ago, Amazon moved um, the entire Comixology web front from the Comixology website to their Kindle store in the Amazon.com website. Um, and the functionality and accessibility of that website went from something I was very comfortable and familiar with to something that was just entirely foreign to navigate. And by merging with the Kindle store, they changed the functionality of the app and I could no longer access like the 1500 comics I bought with my older iPad because I had to update to a newer thing, but my older iPad couldn't do the newer thing. So now I was left with an inability to access my library of comics and I emailed technical support and they gave me a bunch of different approaches, but none of them made it easy to read comics. Plus Amazon Kindle storefront is not designed or doesn't have a user interface that was easy, as easy as Comixology. Um, whereas Comixology was super simple to navigate. They had featured sales every week. They had publishers I could click on. I bought comics every week. And since they moved it to the Kindle store, because there was quite a while I couldn't access my comics, I finally bought a new iPad this year and now I can. But at the same time, I'm so disconnected from the habit of reading in the Comixology app that I just... I, I haven't bought anything from them in over a year, nor do I intend to, um, which again, it sucks because it was such a great platform and a great way to get comics to people who didn't have a store or the physical space to store comics. We, we, we live in places of limited space and long boxes take up so much space. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's, I think that's, um, to me, that's why, in all honesty, especially in my older age, I've went to collecting way more graphic novels than I have Sorry. actually getting comic books, just because you know, I can throw it up on the bookshelf. It fits nice. It's just there. It's not much of an issue. Um, whereas, you know, if you're getting comics, you got to board them, you got to bag them, then you got to get one. I, I do love that they started putting nice boxes out like this, though. Yeah, yeah. they're super mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, as opposed to just the plain white, like. It's that stack of shit in the corner that looks like you're half <laughs> packed, you know? Yeah. Like, like yeah. this is a piece of art. Um, mm -hmm. So I do appreciate that, man. What do you? Let me ask you, Zach. Then what do you? What do you think as far as just the effect that not only the purchase of Amazon and Comicology, but just the introduction of web comics as a whole has done to the industry? I mean, web comics is great. Like that's like. To, you know, probably one of the biggest democratizing acts in in 
access to comics and people who can create them and the types of stories that you can tell because there is no limit to sort of what a web comic can be or or the format and how it's released all that kind of stuff but like i'm someone who's been in the comic book industry as like a writer for like six years and i think at that point in time comiXology had already been purchased by amazon and that to me was like i was like you've sold the only place to get digital comics is the largest retailer that is like known for screwing over like the book industry i just found that so interesting and i'd love to be a fly on the wall for what happened years ago to sort of facilitate that deal where they got like exclusive distribution to digital goods because like it's hard to imagine but i mean there's an alternate version of comics where we have like a very thriving digital space where web comics and and different uh digital releases are sort of thriving together uh and a you know and a website that looked like the original comiXology website where all the publishers are listed and you see new releases and stuff i used to love going on comiXology the day i had a comic coming out and watch it tick up or tick down <laughs> the new release uh like because they would like rate them from like one to 200 how things were doing right and you could kind of get a general vibe for how your book was doing on the day just by how the digitals were were selling and now that's something that like you know creators have lost access to that but over the last couple of years we've also lost access to like even sales numbers in general which is really interesting so we're kind of at this weird point where it's all very nebulous yeah, yeah. and you know even speaking from like a career standpoint i did a book called the house with artist drew zucker we worked on the house for seven years and when we completed it, it's a, whole, a World War II haunted house story. Um, we actually took it to Comixology Submit, which was their independent creator platform where you could do a book and send it to them. And if they approved it, and usually the approval was about technical specs, you had to follow their specifications for them to package it. Then they would release it. And we released all seven issues of the house on Submit. Uh, and then we kickstarted a, a physical trade. And then after we sold pretty much the whole run of the trade, we approached Dark Horse Comics. Uh, and asked if they were interested in doing like a wide mass market reprint and they did so i mean it was this is now a book that lives in dark horses catalog with penguin random house that we initially released through comiXology submit and you can't do that anymore so it, it really closed down an avenue to lots of independent creators uh that's that's sad too because i mean it makes me think i'm i mean you could still use the kickstarter aspect as far as then mm -hmm. to kind of kick off because i know erica erica schultz did that with the uh, deadliest bouquet uh, yep. which ended up an image as far as releasing, uh, which is fantastic. I want to point out with a very great twist ending. I'm going to, has, is the dark horse released that as a trade paperback? Uh, the one that I did. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. It was released in November of 2021, I think. All right. So yeah, it's out. Every time I have someone, someone on the show, I got to hit up Dave at comic book and be like, Hey man, <laughs> 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 do me a favor and get me this way. Uh, <laughs> The show is becoming expensive. Not even the fact of running it, just because I keep buying more comics. <laughs> which is which is fantastic because I mean I've ran across so many great books. <clears throat> I mean everything from Sherlock Holmes and a Wonderful Conundrum, which is a is something you could totally read to a kid or enjoy as an adult, to a zero box time machine to a deadliest bouquet, which I would not recommend for children. <laughs> Just to be clear, sure. <laughs> but, you know, and I think that's nice the variety you see. So I mean, you still do have that aspect, but that's that's kind of terrifying. I mean, is there anything out there that you guys know of that has a possibility to replace Comicsology to make it to where you can more market digitally comic books in that aspect? I haven't seen anything that feels like it is stepping into that place i know there are companies that are trying it global comics right now is trying to do a lot of that stuff um, and they just signed some exclusive deals with image and boom and a couple other places and they're launching their beta site here shortly i think there was talk about uh launch at c2e2 um, but uh, at the same time i haven't yet seen it and had seen how well it replaces comicsology so i mean like fingers crossed that someone does it was really great and important but at this point i don't know of anything quite yet yeah, there's also Omnibus app or something like that as well, where there's more people getting into the space, at least, which is cool. 
Competition yeah. is probably good, honestly. Yeah, well, I'm talking about big two creators, both Marvel and DC have created digital comic apps in the meantime. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, that's not independent creators, but I can subscribe to Marvel Unlimited, which, you know, ties into why we're here or uh, whatever the DC <laughs> version is, where you pay like <laughs> pay like a yearly subscription fee and you get access to this gigantic library of digital stuff that they update every single week um, with old stuff and new stuff as well. You, you you know I feel I, I I feel like I should know the name of the DC one, but I don't. But I do realize I very much wish I had a subscription to Marvel Unlimited, so um, I could very much have read X Men Unlimited at least seventy five because I'm pretty sure it's up there. I don't know if seventy six is, but let's get into that, gentlemen. I'm I'm curious. Sure. The story you you guys are telling right now was it something that was pitched to you or you pitched to them as far as you focusing it on Merrill or Marrow and Farrell. I tried to combine their names. <laughs> um, it was not so. I I pitched it to Marvel. I mean, geez, uh, probably in like June of last year, and uh, I'd I'd worked with Lauren Amaro, who was the editor on the series um, on Yondu, uh, like in 2019. And we've always been in touch and we've always been talking and uh, she reached out, yeah, like probably mid last year. And we talked about a bunch of different characters and, and different types of approaches. And like I had something that I wanted to do with Darwin, um, which I'm still keeping close to my chest because I love that character and like would love to do this. Um, then I also pitched something with Basilisk, which is like one of the guys from the... Um, the Morrison run, the guy who like shoots the photokinetic like blasts, who was in like the the remedial class. I'm the name is failing me, but like with Beak and yeah, all those other weirdos, and he's only really been in those issues, and then he died. And I was like, I want to bring him to Krakoa, and uh, Marvel was like, No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got talking about just characters that to me. Um, had the potential to sort of like be the POV character in an issue. And if you kind of look at Mero in the nineties, when she was created, she was a POV character and she was a very important part of the team. And especially during the like Carlos Pacheo years where like he like just defined her in this really fantastic way. So I have always been a fan of those issues and I made that very clear in the early conversations we had and so it kind of just grew from there. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we were kind of allowed to run with the story that we wanted and, and define her in this new way because she's kind of been, I won't say shelved, but she's sort of just been in the background for most of the Krakoan era. So it was fun to kind of like put her on a new path, so to speak. Now, and... What do you think, Phil, of, of drawing those characters? I mean, because they are two characters that that have had they, they both got a fair deal of legacy. I mean, it's not there's obviously X Men that have far more legacy to them because um, mm -hmm. it's the X Men and it's existed for fifty damn years now. I think at this point, I you know it's there's a lot of legacy there. Um, yeah. I, I mean, but you're dealing with key, uh, with two characters that have very defining features as far yeah. as you know, one's ostensibly a werewolf, though they never call her that. But I mean, that's very much what Feral is in a, a lot of different ways. I mean, there at least shares a lot of characteristics with a werewolf. And then Meryl's got bones that just grow out of her, which I always <laughs> thought that, that was a great power. Like, like, look, you piss me off. I'm going to pull this out and stab you. With it. What is it? It's my bone. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. I mean, coming. <clears throat> Feral was created by Rob Liefeld, and so like a very distinct early 90s look. And then, you know, it's been in the books for a long time. And then Mero came along. Uh, we were talking, I think it's the like Joe Kelly, Steve Siegel, uh, Carlos Pacheco yeah. era. Just a really great look. But I think over the last couple of years, like I know Mero has had so many different looks throughout the time. Feral's looks have kind of have shifted here and there. So, yeah, coming back around to see like who's done what with them recently. So it was Stefano Casili and Marauders had done some stuff with Mero. And then uh, Claudia, what's this Claudia's last name in the uh, Marvel Voices? Uh, uh, but because but, Claudio Benelli um, did, a, did a short with Sophie Campbell uh, with the two of them. And I was able to kind of yeah. look to see, oh, what is what does Feral look like here in Krakoa? And then kind of find a look that has 
callbacks to their classic features, but also kind of like where we last saw them. How does that that, that influence them? So it's real fun. I mean, I think interacting with fans and readers and kind of looking at their takes as we were as our issues were coming out recently to kind of see like who was who was reacting to what look and and you know like marrow's one of those ones you can go really hard into like you know there's there's like bone spurs growing out the head and she's bald look or there was the time where it was like sexy marrow and i don't <laughs> so just to find the look oh. somewhere somewhere in the center because like she's she is very strong she is very aggressive the bones are very aggressive but at the same time she doesn't necessarily have to look like a horror monster so just sure. trying to find kind of a look in there that kind of landed where i felt uh, best served for our story there was there was always this part of me with marrow that i was like she sort of looks like a female doomsday in a lot of ways. I mean, not skin complexion, okay. but obviously, like, you know, doomsday and her share the feet. I mean, he obviously, it's very different. It's like rocks. I don't even know what you would call that are coming off of doomsday. <laughs> but Mero yeah. has that same aesthetic as far mm -hmm. as it, it looks very, very similar. Um, I'm curious, then, Zach, what do, what do you think as far as writing the X-Men in the Crocara era, knowing that they can die? And it doesn't really matter. Have you have you put these two in a storyline where if they die, they die? I mean, I I love that as a component, just in general, just because it's such a thing that death is not permanent in comics, just in general. So there's this idea that embracing it kind of gives you this new way to talk about it and these really fun, reflexive sort of the, the whole arc is basically about what happens to X-Men when they die and then they get resurrected, but who's cleaning up their bodies, what's happening to them. And I kept thinking about that sort of thing and going like, well, yeah, like there's going to be just like leftover X-Men parts like everywhere all over the world. And, and someone somewhere needs to th be thinking about that and, and, and want those pieces. Right. And I think like, I don't know. I find it very interesting. And Mero specifically is someone who um, is very, very tough and, and hard to kill. And so she's this person that sort of doesn't have, I don't think she's ever died. I could be wrong. Um, I know she like lost a pregnancy and has had some experience with death in that way, but I don't know. I don't think she's ever died but I'm sure someone will come out of the woodwork and be like, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't believe she ever has. And as far as superheroes never dying, like I said, I just mentioned Doomsday. That's one of the most iconic when they smoke Superman and he's obviously still around. Um, but um, I, I just want to know, Zach, I know your last name is not Wagner, but are you related to Doug? That was really morbid. <laughs> okay. No, um, no relation. <laughs> okay. I just had to ask, man, because... Maybe you just need some cannibalistic furries to go around and clean up the X-Men, you know? It would work. Uh, <laughs> it is uh, consistent with my brand, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I remember getting the scripts for the project from Lauren early on. And, like, uh, Zach and I have known each other for a couple of years, but it's not like mm -hmm. we've, like, lived in this spot where we're hanging out or anything. It's just kind of convention and online interactions. And as soon as I started reading the scripts, I was like, Yep, this is a Zach Thompson script. It's like body <laughs> horror. It is all oh, it is grotesque characters and quirky. I was like, this is perfect. I a hundred percent get what this is now. <laughs> I and like, you know, to be honest, like I I'm so drawn to X-Men with like physical mutations, and I think that that's something that um is an aspect of the mutant metaphor that is not often addressed or or we don't have a lot of like modern stuff about you know uh how do mutants with visible mutations sort of exist in krakoa and what does that look like and i'm really fascinated and sort of like because the mutant metaphor is so broad right it can be applied to so many things and one of the things that i find very interesting is like just the like disability rights movements and how do you how do you be someone who ostensibly like marrow has uh like a mutation that is a little bit of a disability and that you have to like walk around and, and you are visibly a mutant and you can never kind of remove that from who you are. So you have to identify with that um, on some level. And I think that that's just 
fun, right? Like that's one of the things that like I tried every mutant who shows up has some sort of like weird physicality to their mutation. Um, because one, those are most of the Morlocks sort of fall into that category. But two, it's just an interesting subset of mutantdom that I feel like we don't get to explore that often. And X-Men Unlimited is great for sort of like taking these, you know, oddball weirdos that don't often get the spotlight and, and allowing them to kind of do some fun stuff for a couple of weeks. It's yeah. it's funny because I think the greatest, um, and I'm going to say mutant when I say this, um, and you all will understand when I say the character's name, that, that has a physical normality or normality that's the most popular would obviously be Deadpool. That's why I said mutant, because he's technically not a mutant. He just, you know, he's been genetically altered with Wolverine's healing factor. And if y'all don't know the story behind that, go Google it. I promise. It's really, really, <laughs> really Googleable, especially now. I mean, you can find I me. Mean, like I said, we brought up Rob Liefeld, who created uh, Wolfbane. I mean, he also is one of the co-creators of Deadpool. Shout out to Fabian, who's been a past guest on the show. Um, but I, I gotta know, Zach, with what you've just said, how is Batman your favorite character now and growing up? <laughs> uh, I mean, I honestly, like, it's just probably, like, I was the right age where Batman the Animated Series came on when I was, like, six years old, and, um, I just, like, you know, I was in that pipeline right away and engaging with that material and, kind of aged up with it and one of the things that's interesting about batman especially is like you know i'm 34 um like as i got older there was more movies there was more like graphic novels that were available to me so you can kind of like age with batman in this interesting way where you can like you know engage with it as a child and then as you get older you can look at some of the more like edgy frank miller whatever stuff and kind of go like oh interesting there's another angle to this character so there's for me i just love batman because he's like you can kind of put him in anything and he kind of works and and is sort of the the epitome of of uh noir comics which is like yeah i can't i can't get enough uh we won't go into how psychotic he is we've gone into that in enough past episodes so let's <laughs> let's face it batman is in, in my opinion, anyway, he's probably the most psychotic popular superhero out there. But I do think it's funny, Phil, uh, I mean, you brought up Spider-Man, and I think he kind of yeah. uh, goes to the same ilk as far as you can definitely age with him. And, you know, there are stories for younger, and then you can continue to get into darker and darker things. So I want both yeah. of your opinions on something we went into a past fan con. Um, Phil, I want to hear this from you first. You think sure. comics have gotten too much of an edge like have they become too dark in recent times or do you or do you think there's something else there no i mean i think i think it's it's a it's a it's an important question and it's been being it's been posed for the last like 30 or 40 years and i think there's just constant comics are in kind of in a constant evolution and an up and down uh, and there's times when there's themes or approaches that will appear uh, will appeal more towards like darker or edgier stuff, and then there's times when things are much like lighter and will appear appeal. Sorry, I'm like, what's where's my words at tonight? Um, to different groups entirely. Like, I mean, obviously you've got things like Craven's Last Hunt, which is a really really famous Spider-Man story from the late '80s, early '90s, and that's Mike Zeck. And who wrote that one? Was that Jerry Conway? No, it wasn't. Jam 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 Demon 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 Yes, thank you. Um, and that wait, is, wait, wait, very wait, wait. very dark. Are either of you related to Tom Borvall? As much as you are like just calling up names like that, I'm impressed. I just but continue. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so you know, like it's like it's, super, it's Tom Brevoort. I yep. fuck his name up so often. He probably <laughs> hates me, but Tom, I love you. He's actually one of the <laughs> questioners. He's actually one of the gentlemen that had this discussion with us. That's why y'all are on point Thank bringing up know. names. Yeah, great guy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and yeah, like so you have stuff like that, which is a very dark tale, um, a very kind of like you know, uh, Dark Knight Returns inspired style. But then, you know, a handful of years later, you've got uh, like Ultimate Spider-Man, like Brian Bendis and Mark Bagley, which is a much more like um, more optimistic take on Spider-Man. At the same time, you had that concurrently running with J. Michael Straczynski and John Romita Jr.'s Amazing Spider-Man, which is my favorite Spider-Man run of all time. A couple of years later, you got Kari Andre, Andre, Andrews, Andrews, ugh, uh, Spider-Man Reign, which again is like another similar 
Frank Miller Dark Knight take on future Spider-Man, which is another one of my favorite Spider-Man stories. And it's just kind of back and forth. you got Dan Slott and Nick Spencer. You've got, you know, just kind of a wave back and forth. So I don't think that comics are necessarily getting too dark. I think it just kind of depends where we're at in the cycle of stories. I was talking to Bob Shrek years ago, and Bob Shrek was an editor at DC and Dark Horse and a bunch of stuff. And though I think his his idea has evolved over time, his point was like, we make comics for, he said 14-year-olds, but essentially it was in 14-year cycles, you'll start to see the same stories told again and again, and not necessarily repetitive, but like there is every X amount of years, you see a tonal shift as it's like, oh, we need to bring in new readers. And sometimes we will see repetitive themes and cycles and approaches, but it's more so how can we take what we're doing and pivot and change to see what new blood we can bring in as readers. And after X amount of years, we'll we'll pivot again and see what happens. So there's just this constant evolution that it's like, if you don't like comics now, that's cool. Wait like three or four years and comics will shift in such a way that you might really like comics then. It, it's really kind of uh, exciting in that way. As much as maybe like as a longtime fan, it can be a little tiring when you've read comics for 40 years and I'm like, I've read everything three times in a row or three times over. But at the same time, it's like, there's still cool stuff to be had regardless of what you like. I man, he made so many points I want to elaborate on, but before I get into any of that, I want Zach, Zach, I want to hear your point so I can just have more stuff to elaborate on. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, it's mostly just a complete agreement. Like I, I look at even like we might be in a period where it's like darker now, but like, if you look at, even 10 years ago, like the most popular things that were coming out were like Squirrel Girl and, and Miss Marvel and uh, Gwenpool and and stuff that's like very light and very um, meta and, and very like geared towards children entirely. Right. Like in this in this really wonderful candy colored uh, way. And I, I think like there's there's always going to be um, peaks and valleys and in, in how dark things are, but also like the zeitgeist changes, the audience changes. One of the things that's interesting about being a comic book creator, I'm on year six, year seven, maybe, if you want to consider the first year I was writing where nothing was coming out, but I was still sort of engaged with it. It is like, I've actually seen my own audience change and I've seen the audience sort of change over the time that I've been creating comics and like, you know, not for a bad thing, but just sort of like, tastes have changed over that period of time and and you see new readers come in and you see other people fall off people that you were talking about your work every single day all of a sudden they haven't tweeted in two or three years or or whatever and i think that sort of stuff is good i think we always will comics are just such a wonderful medium that can kind of react uh very quickly especially superhero comics because they're getting made every like 30 days there's a new issue coming out and and you know once you're in that production cycle like it's quick and so i think there's a way to um reflect the darkness of the world that's going on or to refute the darkness of the world that's going on whatever the creative team kind of chooses to imbue the project with and i think that like you kind of always need that balance you know like no matter what and and i fully agree with both of you um for pretty much every point that you've made. And I think the thing that a lot of people lack the understanding of within the comic book industry, especially those that don't partake in comic books, um, and even if you only partake in comic books at, like, the main, we'll say the main two, though technically there's three, because, I mean, it's, it's Marvel, DC, and Image now. I mean, if Image didn't establish itself with The Walking Dead, I don't know what anyone else is thinking. Everyone knows what The Walking Dead is. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, I mean, if you're only reading DC and Marvel, but then I think there's a lot of stuff that you miss out on, and you miss the fact that pick a genre. You know what I mean? I mean, you both have worked in horror comics as well, which we had a discussion on previously in This Month in Comics. I think Tim Seeley is a, a creator that really helped change what horror comics were in the modern era, you know, as opposed to what they had been. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you literally... you. You can't name a genre that does not exist in the comic book world, whether it's anything from it's Jeff to to plush, you know, and everything in between and some things that are on other sides of either what I just named, which is 
which is a pretty extreme genre <laughs> I mean, yeah. to cover as far as that's, I mean, what else do you include, really? Um, and, I, and I think that's something that a lot of people misunderstand. But I'm curious as far as with what we're referring to with the X-Men, or, well, we'll just stick to the main two with Marvel and DC. Do you think, and this is something we've got into past episodes, do you think, like, a lot of people find it intimidating as far as to jump into one of those two universes? Because, I mean, they have so much legacy there. And I think a lot of people walk into stores and, and either you don't want to talk to a clerk, which, look, if you're if you're in the Indianapolis area, go to Comic Book University. Talk to Dave. <laughs> Dave will point you to comic books that, that will lead you to where, like, tell him what you're into. He'll find yeah. you a comic you enjoy. That's and and I think pretty much every comic book store at least has one associate like that to where they're so into comics they enjoy it. And I think there's a certain amount of int- intimidation in that. Do you think that has an effect on the industry? I mean, and then do you also have people that are just jumping in and reading online? So they have nobody guiding them. They're just jumping into things. And like if you jumped in randomly into the X-Men right now without knowing certain things about the Procara era. I mean, how confused would you be? Like, why are they immortal? What is going on? You know? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, I, I don't know. I think, so I'm of two minds. Yes, it is intimidating to jump in, but also everyone does it at some point and sort of figures their way out and or figures their way in or whatever. And, like, I can remember reading X-Men comics when I was, like, six or seven and i and i think about the 90s and i'm like i was reading 90s x-men comics i was certainly wasn't understanding anything because i've had to go back and read them for work and i'm still kind of like oh my god what's going on (laughs) (laughs) and so like i i i think there is a I think it can be intimidating, but like anything, right? Any new hobby. Like if you go to get into magic cards, you're going to be like, I don't know where to begin. I don't know how to, you know, or like I want to start painting Warhammer. I don't know where to start with Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. You can name all kinds of these hobbies. And the reality is, is like it's intimidating from anyone from the outside. But I do think when it comes to superhero comics, you can kind of pick up any trait of Batman and figure it out. You can pick up any trait of X-Men and probably figure it out. It's not that difficult. And there are methods that people like uh, us use, like whenever you're creating these stories to kind of make them as accessible as possible. There are certain house rules when you're writing like a Marvel comic where you're like, you have to name drop everyone, right? Simple thing, but like it it gets ingrained into you when you enter that that world because they're saying like, you know, just name check all these people they all look crazy people need to know who they are and you know you go i've been reading this for 10 years these people don't need to be name checked like they they know who they are and it's like well no there's someone i think about my mom a lot when i started writing superhero comics and i started writing with cable and i had to explain to my mom who cable was and it was just like it you know that wasn't a short conversation and uh, and she was just sort of like super excited for me but also you know barely hanging on and i'm like but she got into it and now she reads x-men comics and i'm like if my 60 year old mother can get into x-men comics anyone can <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point, especially if you're starting at cable. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Really, the the genetic clone of Madeline Pryor and Scott Summers that was created by <laughs> Mr. Sinister that has a techno-organic vibe. Look, just saying all that, and that doesn't cover near of what cable is, there's a lot more. Kind of made my damn head hurt. And I've read all of Cable versus Deadpool. I've been a fan of cable, like, for, for a very... Very, very, very long time. But yeah, I mean, you do make a valid point, man. I think that's important. I'm curious though, and um, I, 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 I want, I want Phil. Uh, I'm curious on you, man. Like, and sure. both of your answers in this. But what's the difference between you guys as far as from working on an independent creation or something where there's obviously more freedom, as opposed to working on a Marvel title? Because I know with a Marvel title, you know, like, like, look. Man, Zach, when you were writing Cable, there's certain things you just couldn't do. Whether you thought they were good ideas or not, 
the editor's going to look at you like you're insane if you pitch certain ideas, you know, mm-hmm. just because, and I mean, that's because it's a, it's a large product. It's a huge universe. It's completely understandable. Um, how do you guys, like, have you ever had a situation come across where you, either you really wanted to do something either artistically or story-wise, and they were just like, no? And how do you handle all those critiques? I mean, I'll let Zach is, has actually done a lot more comics uh, as a writer bouncing between both corporate and independent comics. So if he wants to start, and then I can give my two cents for the experience I've had. I, I yeah, It's very simple. Honestly, it's like, don't get married to anything when it comes to superhero stuff and just be super down to build and, and collaborate because it's like, it's like improv. It's yes and. Like, you don't get married to anything because you don't own any of it, right? And so it's like, I, will, I think this is a great idea. And someone's like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And you're like, cool, let's go on to idea number two then, you know? <laughs> like, because it's just not worth getting upset over. Everyone's there to to create the best comic that they possibly can. And I think the thing that I've learned in the in the short time that I've been doing this is that the company and the and your editor knows the characters better than you do no matter what you're coming in into it from an outsider's perspective and they're they're in it they're living in that world the whole time so they're trying to help you tell the best story that will work within the ecosystem of the publishing mandate that they have currently um but when it comes to creator own stuff it's just like all of those frustrations about all these cool things that you wanted to do, you take them and you do them in, in your own stuff. And, you know, you're allowed to experiment and, and to fail. And, and, you know, like the reality is, is that like you couldn't write an experimental third person perspective narration, like over a hundred years of the Marvel universe in one single comic, but you could do that in a creator own book and, and do something wacky. And then it might not land with people, but at least you tried it and you you sort of satiated that uh, thirst that you had for that weird creative impulse that you wanted to do. And and the only person that sort of like uh, loses out from that big risk is you, which or you and your creative team that have all agreed to kind of do that and and to take that risk. And I think there's just I don't know. I and the only other thing I'll say is Matthew Rosenberg once said to me that. All of your superhero work is a sprint and all of your creator own work is a marathon. And to think of it that way, um, when you're sprinting, you're sort of just doing it, whatever energy that people can feed you. Right. You're just sort of moving with it and going with it. And a marathon is much more deliberate and paced and you can kind of make really risky decisions, but you can have a plan for them. You know, and real quick before you answer that question, Phil, because I definitely want to hear your answer. I do want to say you made a very excellent point, Zach, in the fact that, yeah, the editors know. Like, go look at Tom's website. I And Mm -hmm. and if you have the time to look through everything of Tom's website, I think you might have too much free time. That's kind of here (laughs) or there, right? Because Tom's website, because when he came on initially um, for, for an interview as well as when he came on for the PanCon, like, that man's website is extensive and his is his comic book knowledge period is insane so i would imagine Mm -hmm. that if you brought something to him that he would just be like no that character wouldn't do that and and he's probably right he's like 99.99999 percent of the time i don't think tom would be wrong in that i don't i mean it it might just flat out be a hundred in all honesty and like i said i say that just scanning his website like I have, which I haven't looked through all of it because I got comics to read and and <laughs> I gotta make sure this show comes out and and if I literally if I look through all of Tom's website, that would be my life for a year, I think, because there's a lot there, you know. So yeah, you make a very valid point in that as far as the editors, man. Uh, but yeah, Phil. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things that, like Zach pointed out, with creator-owned stuff, you kind of have the the world open to you to do what you want to do. Uh, the downside to that is that you have the world open to you to do what you want to do. There's uh, the the marathon uh, analogy is is really apt because the uh, amount of choices you can make is essentially limitless. So sometimes it can take a lot more work, effort, and time 
to define those worlds, to define the rules, to define kind of the laws in which you have to work within your story. Um, versus, you know, you get hired to write a Spider-Man comic, you know kind of what a Spider-Man comic is going to be, where you can go, where you can't go, what types of stories you will be telling, and who that character is. Um, so doing a creator-owned stuff is is, is uh, deeply and, and uh, immensely creatively satisfying, but it also is an ex excessive amount of emotional labor in just making a million decisions. Um so I, I've I've really enjoyed the creator on work that I've got to do, but you know the the upside to something like a, a corporate uh, free, a work for hire uh, job with like DC or Marvel is they when they hire you, you kind of know what you're doing. Obviously, there's room within the boundaries that you're given to bring your own unique voice and sense of style and, and imprint to everything. Um, so there's some aspects of that is almost a little bit easier. Um, to be like, oh, okay, these are mandates we have to meet. These are things I can just see where I can find the pieces to elevate the material. Um, and then, you know, kind of um, from a common sense business standpoint, creator owned books can be very financially successful. They can also be two or three years <laughs> plus worth of investment into a project that makes you zero money. Um, whereas, you know, working for like a Marvel or DC or some work for hire project where you are paid a rate. You are you turn the work in, you get your paycheck and you can move on to the next one. And then there's a there's a bit of stability there that is nice. And I think for me on a personal uh, kind of like my career, I kind of bounce back and forth from one project to the other. I'll do work for higher stuff for a while and then pivot and do a creator own book for a while and then pivot back and kind of, you know, you keep doing as you're sharpening your skills and you're becoming a better creator and you're you're getting to know more people and, and kind of defining what your work is and. And then, you know, just kind of go where you want to go from there. All right. Same question for both of y'all. I Y'all can answer in whatever order you choose. All right. Well, two-part question, really. One, which one do y'all find more emotionally satisfying? All right. Two, is there a character out there and just any character that's established? And, I mean, you can go pick a character i yeah you can pick he-man you can pick cyclops you can pick, you can pick superman whatever that you would really like to be able to work on i mean i can answer those real quick on for me i think the emotional satisfying thing uh changes with time um there's been times i've been able to do creator own books that are just like i put every part of my soul into that book and still to this day i'm super proud of those books uh, right now, doing stuff for Marvel is an absolute bl uh, blast and a delight because I've been since the time I was nine years old, which is we're just going to say multiple decades ago. We're going to say 30, <laughs> 30, 31 years ago. Uh, I was like, I want to do comics. I want I literally uh -huh. bought X-Men number one, Jim Lee, Chris Claremont. And I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to draw X-Men. This is all I want to do with my life. And it took me another 20 plus years to break in and another 10 to 15 years, 10 to 12 years of just solid work to finally get work at marvel and that's only happened in the last like seven or eight months so for me right now where i'm at getting work with marvel right now and it's been announced but i'm, I'm working on um, a venom and carnage comic that is going to be on marvel unlimited uh as i mean not marvel yeah marvel limited as well so it'll be a digital book but just getting to work on those core characters again grew up reading 90s comics like there's there's at this point in my career there's an a, there's a deep emotional satisfaction getting to getting paid to play in the marvel sandbox i'm sure there will be some point where i'm like oh man i've got this other story of my own i'm dying to tell there's some that i'm working on in the background that i will get to eventually um kind of in the next you know next couple of years but right now it's that uh, and then as a character that I've, I would love to work on, and, and Zach already got to work on this character, but Cable is one of my my, uh, <laughs> my boys. If you have followed me on Twitter or Instagram, I'm constantly raving about Cable. And just Cable's history is both cr like insane, but also like the perfect distillation of what comics can be, like the imaginative boundaries of comics. No, no limits because Cable exists and his crazy convoluted backstory and um, I also tend to gravitate. I've, I've realized as I've gotten older to like like grumpy dad characters, like mm -hmm. Cable, Wolverine, like any any sad dads. Like I, I absolutely love characters who have like a paternal, uh, not even strictly dad, but just like a, a parental figure that is is not as obvious, but really just cares about the people under their charge. So those are my those are my two answers. I just real quick, I, I gotta ask then as. As the Wave Wilson of hip hop and, and a huge fan of Deadpool for 
ever. We won't get into how many years either. Um, <laughs> what did you think of when they made him a father? Oh, see, I don't know a whole lot about Deadpool's. I was listening to a podcast on this um, a couple of weeks ago, and I was like, holy cow. Isn't that the one with, didn't, was Threnody involved in that one? And then in a Cullen Bunn comic, they kill Deadpool's kid or something like that. Am I remembering that right? No. Okay, I don't know. No, no, no. I think they did that in an alternate timeline. But in the actual 616 universe, hope I'm not spoiling this for anyone, but it's been a while since they did it. Um, she, she had a disease and Sinister had the cure and he's like, look, go kill these six people and I'll cure your kid. And Deadpool's like, fuck, fine, I'll do it, (laughs) whatever, whatever. And then funnily enough, one of them was Cable. (laughs) I'll have to look that up. (laughs) Yeah, it was, it was a very intriguing storyline that showed, uh, a different side of Wade Wilson's character than's ever been shown. You know what I mean? But yeah, but Zach. Um, He's like, I forgot the question. Y'all started rambling. The emotional satisfaction. Yeah. 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 Um, Yeah. I mean, nothing uh, like to be perfectly real, nothing beats writing a character that you've loved since you were a child and seeing your words come out of that character's mouth it's it's honestly like it's it it comes it's probably the closest to like life affirming in in this really interesting way and like i think creator owned work can also be that in a really big way because it's like i guess the best way that i think of it is like i put pieces of myself into these characters whereas when I do creator own work, I'm putting a piece of myself like out into the world and um, different aspects of that. Right. Because it's like, you can't always see where I put myself into cable, but when you read my creator own work, you're going to definitely understand a different aspect of something that I care about deeply um, because it's like that, you know, the act of making something from scratch is this big act of faith and hope that someone will connect with this crazy thing that you've been putting together for two or three years. And there is something profoundly beautiful about someone finding something like that and saying, this really moved me or this really made me. Um, I saw something the other day that was like my first comic. Um, There was like this thing going around that people were like, what's the comic that got you hooked or brought you back into comics? And uh, Mark Bouchard, tweeted that the dregs uh, was the comic that sort of made him fall in love with comics. And that was the first comic I've ever written. And I, I literally had this moment the other day where I was like, there's another comic book writer out there, like inspired by my work. That's so weird to me. That doesn't <laughs> feel real. That doesn't, cause it's like, I don't feel like I've been doing this that long that there, but it's like, that was six years ago. That's enough time for, someone to read it, to be inspired by it, to create their own work, to whatever. And it just it just kind of dawned on me in this really interesting way where it's like, these are all these big things where you put a piece of yourself out into the world and you have no idea sort of what it will do. And, and so I think short-term emotional feelings with superhero stuff is like right there, it's palpable. You can feel it in the moment. And sometimes those like longer projects that take more time can end up meaning so much more to you over a longer period of time because people keep coming to them or, or you keep going like, Oh wow. People keep finding this thing that shouldn't, (laughs) shouldn't exist or or like shouldn't uh, be widely available. And then the other thing, uh, the other side of your question is uh, I think writing Batman really something like clicked for, for me where I was like, it, some of this doesn't feel real all the time. Like you're kind of just like, we like fun. I'm writing cable. And you're like, and then you kind of like look back on it and you're like, Oh wow, that happened. And I think for me, I always had this idea that I was like, I want to write Batman. I don't care what it is. I just want to write some version of Bruce Wayne at some point. And then when that happened in this past year, I kind of had to take a step back and, and go like, okay, I got to get some new goals here. Like I kind of, I kind of <laughs> crossed the top of the list and then I was like, Oh shit. Like I gotta, and it's like, that's a really wonderful and privileged thing 
to feel and and to kind of sort through and then you kind of also you know doesn't feel exactly the way you imagined it sometimes it feels better sometimes it feels different it's all these different things that you have to kind of sort through but um yeah there's nothing there's really nothing like it i don't know i i mean like i i am at this point so addicted to it like the the idea of like putting stuff into the world and and comics in this weird wonderful way the community so tight and and supportive that like I don't know. I just never thought this would be the case, but now I'm here and I'm doing it and I'm like thrilled. I find every time I release a new book, I think this is the one that's going to end my career. No one's going to read it. And I go to bed that night and I'm like nervous. And then the next morning I wake up and there's all these people who have read it and there's like this community based around it. And it just like fills you with this like joy, really. It's really wonderful. I don't know. I love it. Are you sure you're not related to Doug Wagner, Zach? And I always <laughs> say that because one of his, when we were conversating with Doug, and, and check it out, it was a phenomenal quest, as has this been. Um, but one of his things, he's like, man, I just can't believe, honestly, Image keeps putting out my work every time I turn in a script. <laughs> I think it's good to be grateful, right? I think there's a, there's a world, like... I was a journalist for years, which I didn't like doing. And, and uh, like, you know, journalist during like the Trump er- era, early years. So it's like, you know, my every day I would wake up, we'd have a meeting in a boardroom where it'd be like, well, this is what he did today. Like, you know, good luck with everything you've been working on because none of it makes sense anymore because like they've nuked this whole thing or whatever. And, and it was like emotionally draining, really difficult work that, was fulfilling when you did it right but it's like there's just a different aspect to this that is just like i'm so grateful to be able to do it and it feels um, so silly when yeah the world's um, a weird place and i'm like i'm yeah. working on my little comics zach i'm so sorry that you were a reporter during the trump era <laughs> i yeah, don't wasn't fun i that seems like uh just yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was a I do. copywriter before that, which was equally not fun. So you hurt my brain a little with that one, Zach. I'll be real honest. Like he, a reporter during the Trump, I think that would be my that would be my hell. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, it's like, yeah, yeah. That's that's I I can't. Oh my god, dude, you you. I don't even know where to take this now based on the fact that you said you were a reporter during the Trump era. Like, it makes me want to take this real political and be like, what's the dumbest thing you had to deal with when that happened? So much. So much. (laughs) And the fact that that's your answer doesn't surprise me one damn bit, which is terrible on so many levels. I, I got it. Phil, man, we're going to flip. So, out of all the X-Men characters you had a chance to draw on this X-Men Unlimited, is the one that really sticks out and he's like, ooh, yeah. Ooh, it's a real good question. Um, uh, we had a real fun cast that Zach put together on our arc of X-Men Unlimited. Um, who would be my favorite? I'm running through in my head everyone I got to draw. You know what? Um, uh, towards the end of our run, they're all out released now that, uh, at the time of we're recording because Marvel Unlimited is cool. X-Men Unlimited releases weekly. So our five issues was out um, over the last month. Um, I, Zach wrote in uh, the character Chamber from Generation X uh, oh. in the last issue or so. And I've never really drawn Chamber before, but like the Phalanx Covenant, uh, which <laughs> introduced all the Generation X characters, that was like peak X-Men for me in my collecting years as a kid. Uh, spinning off into Generation X, and obviously, like Chris Pachala is just a huge artistic like hero of mine. Um, so for some reason, just getting to draw a little bit of Chamber, and uh, Zach had uh, some really cool ideas with uh, ways to for Chamber to show his power and dealing with uh, a body horror stuff. So like uh, that was actually real, real fun to draw. And then our colorist was just Cece De La Cruz. She did an incredible job mm-hmm. just making the fire in chambers, just, you know, lower half of his body, just, just pop off the page. So I, that was, I don't know, something about that was just an absolute blast to draw. 
I, I appreciate you being able to segue that out of Trump. Because, yeah, no, I, I always <laughs> love Chaber as a character. Like, that's a that's one of those characters that, Zach, you got a problem with body horror. Uh, <laughs> I do, yeah. It's not a problem. It's like, bro. <laughs> 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 ah, pardon me as I die a little over here. Sorry. <laughs> no, excuse me. Um, because yeah, he's one of those characters within especially Generation X that like how horrific of a power is that? Like the yeah, whole I front mean, of my face. Your... Yeah, just, just that's 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 one of the <clears throat> excuse me, I think out of like every I mean there's 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 certain ones that are worse. I can't remember uh, old boy's name. Um I mean, Blob would be bad for obvious reasons. You know, that's just like kind of, yeah, dude, I'm just, I'm just huge. Um, but yeah, Chamber, like you could never, you could never have someone feeling this whole area. So you could never even like kiss someone and have that amount, like that human contact. Like there's, there's so many terrible things about that character that are just, yeah, they, they, they oh man, you've like, I so wait real quick. The X Men Unlimited is that only available on online? You can get that yeah, for the most game. part. Yeah, X Men Unlimited, and they so Marvel Unlimited has a whole series of uh, Infinity comics, which are their <laughs> digital only, and they occasionally will reprint them. Like we were talking about offline, like the Hickman and Deck uh, Declan Shalvey issues were reprinted in physical. Some of the stuff that Steve Orlando and Amelia Laszlo has done, I've been printed. Um, so there's no guarantee that it gets collected, but occasionally it does. But generally, it's exclusively to the app. Uh, well, because I know a lot of those have been collected. A lot of the uh, X Men Unlimited, especially the uh, previous run, have been collected in just stories. You know, like here's this particular story, and this X Men Unlimited comic was included in it. So <laughs> they include it like that. Um, yeah. But yeah, looking at the trades, I didn't see where they ever like had collected a whole run. Man, can I say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that kind of that kind of hurts me right here, because uh, there's this part of me that like I and I don't know about you guys like I, I kind of hate reading comics digitally. I cannot lie. I I guess it's because I'm old. Like I'm an old man over here, and I'm like I want my paper. I, I just I need my paper. Uh, though I have uh, become yeah. yeah. I mean I, I've become more. I've, I've gotten more, especially running the show, because, you know, I've like somebody will send me something. I was like, oh, I need to read this. So I've gotten a bit more leeway as far as like, oh, yeah, OK, it's OK. It's it's still the comic. I'm just not holding it in my hand. It's it's still the comic, though. So so it's OK. It's OK. But again, that's that's just straight up the old man in me, man. But it, as far as you guys have been uh, fans of comics for so long, what do you think about the fact of just... How much comics, like, I mean, because when I was 15, that was it wasn't a cool thing. You know what I mean? Like, if you're wearing, like, if I was wearing this shirt, though, most people have no idea this is a Deadpool shirt. That's why, <laughs> that's why I love it. Right? I love it because, like, you have to know a lot about Deadpool to get that <laughs> that is an actual Deadpool shirt. Um, but, you know, you could wear a Deadpool shirt and people are like, oh, I love Deadpool. And. 90% of them have probably never read a comic in their life, you know? <laughs> but what do you think about that as far as just how much it's permeated pop culture? Like, everyone knows so many characters' names at this point that it's, it's crazy. I mean, there's even characters from Generation X from them doing the New Mutants film that are fairly well known, even though Fox never, let's be honest, Fox never did those films quite <laughs> justice like they could have but we won't get into we won't get into that you know because i do love dread which your was nominated for that though i think that's the best and i think the return of swamp thing i've never had that answer <laughs> <laughs> i had to give you that because yeah. I, I i just watched it recently and i was like this is awful <laughs> yeah never, never had that answer zach is it yeah it's is but but yeah man it was it was pretty terrible but but dread I would I would I would typically have to agree with I think the only thing that upsets me about that film is there like I want to see the dark judges in part like I do yeah I, I want the dark judges in film so bad like I, I want that part of the dread continuality 
in actual film, even though it would be expensive as hell, and that series would really have to take off for them to justify it. But just, what's your guys' opinion as far as, like, you know, there's not the stigma around comics that there used to be. Yeah, I'll let you start with that one, Zach, if you want. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's great. Uh, like, I am... I like when people like things. I, I like when people, when things are uh, inclusive and, and I find that uh, when things are more niche, there can be a more gatekeeping and, and sort of like uh, protecting people from the sacred world of, of comics. And I don't want that. I want more people in Deadpool shirts. I want more people to know who Mero is and the X-Men and stuff. And I don't care why they're fans i mean like realistically like i didn't read a batman comic until i was probably in my 20s honestly i my my love for the character came from the movies and the animated series and then you know come back in another way same with the x-men like with the the cartoon the cartoon was the big entry point for me i was reading random back issues from my older brother but to me, it's like these things that are mechanisms that allow more people to come in and, and love these characters is good. And and honestly, like, I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of people liking things and, and being more excited about the things that I personally have loved for years. So, yeah, it's great. Yeah, and I think, you know, Growing up and even well into adulthood for a variety of reasons, both internal and external, I was never comfortable and struggled with um, communication, openness, vulnerability, discussing things with people. They never felt safe um, for a lot of things, but stories always felt safe. Um, so through stories, I was able to um, open up different worlds and different ideas and opinions and points of views and experiences and have those discussions that I didn't know how to have with people that I didn't know how to have outside of myself. Uh, and so much of who I am um, has been heavily influenced by all of the stories I've read. And obviously a lot of them are comics. Um, so I want access to stories. I want stigmas and barriers to be removed from our abilities to reach outside of ourselves and uh, view and experience and live in different worlds because that can only make us more rounded individuals. So much of how I feel and how I see other humans, a lot of that started with stories breaking down barriers that had been fed to me through cultural and other, uh, you know, memos, you could say, that were just absolute bullshit. Um, but it, it was hard to get outside of those narratives until I had stories in a safe way uh, present me with um, different people in different worlds. And it allowed me to then look outside and realize like, oh, those people exist outside of just this story. And I now have a bridge and a slight understanding of what it is to experience life in their shoes. And it helped me start to bridge those gaps in real life. So yes, like I love that comics as a medium and as a genre and all of these things, or as a medium, um, are are so much more accepted and and available everywhere because it can only lead to like more empathy and connection and communication between people. You make an excellent point, but I tell you, one thing that I think people don't realize as much as I would love them to is uh, I guarantee there are people out there that are like, oh, I would never watch a comic book movie. And I almost guarantee you have. Oh, yeah. No. Probably watch The Crow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Or, or like Blade or Road to Perdition or History of Violence. Or yeah. there's all kinds of yeah, comic book movies that people don't realize. Hell, yeah. man. I, I watched Two Guns when it came out. Right? <laughs> and then I didn't yeah. realize it was a comic book until I brought Stephen Grant on the show. And I was like, oh, shit, I've seen this movie. This is a really good movie. Wait, it's a yeah. comic? Hold the hell on. You know? So, and, and this is coming from someone that, I love comic books, man. When Blade came out, I was like, they're making a Blade movie? Are you kidding me? You know? I mean, 
You can tell <laughs> how much of a Blade fan I am. I got that shit like. Oh yeah, right on. I, I don't know how long ago at Wizard World, man. I still got it. That shit is foam. I'm amazed. It's <laughs> I'm amazed it's made it through everything I've been through in my life and is still in existence to the capacity that it is. But it, that shit's like mint condition. It blows my mind. <laughs> you know, but I do think it's funny, and I do think you guys both make a great point as far as just it allows people to get into the medium, and hopefully, it honestly encourages them to read because. I can't tell you how many people I've had say that comic books definitely affected their level of literacy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because I, I don't understand the stigma behind people. Oh, those are those are those are the funny books. Those are little kids' books. Look, if you handed a twelve-year-old Watchmen and told them to read it, their brain is going to explode. <laughs> All right. I mean, I mean, sincerely, yeah. there's there's so many uh, like. Almost anything by Alan Moore. And it, there's so many people I could name that if you've tried, like, don't don't hand a 12-year-old anything by Garth Ennis, pretty much. Period. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's bad fucking parenting. You know? I mean, it's just... But, it, to Watchmen's credit, the visual storytelling from Dave Gibbons is so strong that even if you might not understand all the words, you would understand, like, what's happening and how the story is being told, you know? I think about all the time when I was reading comics when I was a kid and the visual storytelling was helping me understand words that I didn't know and 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 really just opening me up to sort of like seeing seeing things that maybe I didn't fully grapple with. But I was like so into the art and so pulled in by it that like I wanted to engage with it on a deeper level. I wanted to learn how to read it. And like I think honestly, like it's partly how I learned how to read like uh, on a on a deeper level because like i was just like like i said pouring through back issues of my older brothers just going like i don't know what's going on but i need but i need to know <laughs> and to go back to phil's point for a second because i think it's important like just to talk about the cultural moment that we're in comics can create communities but all art can create a community around it and i think the one of the things that we're seeing, I don't want to get too political, but there are books being banned and, and there are things that are happening to target people of specific identities and, and walks of life that uh, prohibit people from sort of empathizing with that, right? And I think that books are this huge empathy engine that allows us to create connections between each other. And the, when I said earlier that like when you do a creator own book, it's like an act of hope or an act of putting a piece of yourself out that can be so much more than just like, I think it's crazy when I have a jetpack that takes me to other universes. It can be like, I believe that uh, this group of people deserves equal human rights to this other group of people or, or whatever it may be. But this idea that I'm putting out the statement of something that I believe in and hoping that someone somewhere who may not even realize that that theme is there starts to engage with that material, maybe talks to a friend about that book and then they sort of have this conversation that allows them to get to a place where they have a deeper understanding of a complex issue. And they didn't even really realize that that was what was being told to them as they were reading that material. And I think it's so much more important now than ever to talk to people about what you're reading and to engage with people about what they love and to be open about creating like connections with people. Because honest to God, like, the big thing that is happening right now is trying to separate people from one another and trying to break down communities and trying to find ways to make people feel isolated and scared. And we're, we're with the internet and everything. We, we do not have to be isolated. We do not have to be scared. We can share and, and grow and, and create communities around the things that we love. And that's a source of strength, right? I just, I wish I had the graphic novels that I used to in this, but unfortunately this is, I mean, I have, I have one other one too, but I think this is a very important piece of literature in the regards of yep. what you're speaking, that being saga, because it, it gets yep. into so much and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a wonderful comic as well. If you, if you can't read saga as anyone from 15 to older and enjoy it, I just frankly don't know if we can be friends. I'll be real honest. <laughs> um, I, I don't cause it's, it's saga and it's, 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 phenomenal i don't know how you couldn't read that and not enjoy it unless you have some kind of bias in your brain about something within that comic book but um i will say i know 
uh, recently I had a past guest. Um, oh God, I've, we've been on so many quests here recently. Sorry about the bottle dropping. Um, it was just Pepsi, I swear. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we've had so many past guests. I can't even remember who said this, but he uh, asked him what they wanted to bring up on the podcast because I just want to make sure I cover everything for the individuals who we're bringing on because we appreciate everyone that comes over here on the quest. Um, but one of the things he's like, he's like, man, anything except Comic Gate. I had to look up what the hell this was. <laughs> I did not know. And it's because I don't pay attention to things to that effect. Like, I don't, I don't want to hear it. Like, if that's your deal, go away. I don't, I don't, I don't care. Right. But based on what he said, I looked into it. That's for comic gate. Yeah. All right. Right <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. there. Right there. That's for comic yeah. gate. All right. If you if you and and this is coming from the guy that's trying to run this show and make it do good. If you promote and are down with that, stop watching. Right. <laughs> do me a favor. <laughs> just stop watching. Right. Unless you just want to bitch and shit and comment and you know make all these videos get more views to where people that actually care and are sincere in their emotions. I mean, I guess go ahead and do that, but be aware I won't care, right? I really, I really won't, dude. I'm a hip hop artist. You think I care about your bitch ass comic gate and like trying to like no, no, for the love of God, I didn't. Looking into that, it blew my mind a little bit to see that within the comic book community. Like I said, as someone that's been, uh, I've been to cons and like when I was 14, 15, and it's just, it's something I never expected from the comic book community. And it kind of threw me for a loop the more I researched it. Um, we're not going to get in, into it anymore, except like I said, for everyone out there <laughs> that supports comic gay, that's, that's rightly all I have for you. It really is. I'm going to drop this damn bottle again, so I'm going to set that over there. It keeps on wanting to roll off. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I I do not get it, man. But on the, on the note of independent creations, and man, Zach, I'm sorry, like, Mad Cave, Nature's Lilibreth, uh, la uh, Labyrinth. Let me, like, completely mispronounce the word Labyrinth. <laughs> and I said Lilibreth. I literally said Lilibreth. What in the, no wonder I mispronounced the shit out of people's names on this show. I just pronounced Labyrinth, Lilibrinth. All right. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and gloss over that fact. I unfortunately was not, man, I was trying to research everything. Y'all have both respectively done quite a good deal of work, um, which is phenomenal. And I love to see that. Can you give me a synopsis of exactly what that story is? Yeah, for sure. It's um, a group of eight felons put on a complex island uh filled with traps where they have to fight each other to the death to survive um and that series is uh drawn by bailey underwood who's like one of the best artists in action storytelling that's out there right now they're just unbelievable and uh i got to just write a bunch of uh scenes where people fight each other to the death in really brutal kinetic fashion and just watch Bailey absolutely murder those scenes. So it's been a real joy to write. I don't mean to keep going back to this point, but are you sure you're not related to Doug Wagner? <laughs> <laughs> uh, as far as I know, but well, I'll do the 23 and me and we'll see I, what I, happens. I think you and Doug need to figure out if y'all are related based on just some of the things I've heard from this particular quest. <laughs> that sounds very intriguing. Uh, how much of that is dropped? uh five of six issues i think the sixth issue comes out in like two or three weeks so it's almost okay. done okay 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 why eight people uh because it's a nice even number that's easy to write <laughs> 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 it's uh you know honestly like when you're a writer you start to realize that like there is an upper limit of the amount of characters that a story can support and comics is a medium that uh is deals with compression in, in just really interesting ways. And okay. it's like you can you can introduce a lot of people in this in really economical uh fashion. But at the end of the day, like if you want everyone to have um an arc and and a meaningful presence on the page, you really gotta limit your characters. When people write like teams of like 12 characters, I'm like oh. <laughs> like I just 
Yeah, I want to die. Like, I just makes me <laughs> nervous. <laughs> Don't die, Zach. Well, then, I got to ask both of you this. Uh, Phil, I want your answer first, man. What would you guys sure. think as far as uh, dealing with, like, a Marvel or DC event, you know, where you literally do probably have to handle 20, 30, 50 upwards characters? Yeah, that's brutal. I mean, from a writing <laughs> standpoint, that's I can't imagine trying to juggle all that. From an artistic standpoint, that is just so difficult. Like the artists who've done some of those recent giant events. Like I look at Valerio Schiti, who just did the Axe Judgment Day, which was mm -hmm. Avengers versus X-Men versus Inhumans. And I'm just like, I don't know how you juggle that many characters. Or like Pepe Larraz, when Pepe Larraz, like in Ten of Swords, does those double page spreads where it's 8 million people coming to fight 8 more million people. And it's just impressive as hell. And I'm exhausted. And it, thankfully <laughs> they don't usually start newer artists on giant team books. It's like here, start with a small cast of characters. And if you can do that, well, maybe you'll end up in, you know, a team book or a crossover event, but they are, they are impressive pieces of work, and especially the ones that are really good, because I can only imagine how hard it is for even the ones that aren't good, but or the ones that, let's say, maybe the ones that I don't enjoy as much. They might be objectively good, and maybe they just didn't click for me, but then the ones that are just like, this is incredible, I have no idea how you not only pulled off everything, but pulled it off in a way that's so <laughs> satisfying to me. How about writing something like that, Zach? I mean, I, I, I did, uh, in yeah. 2019 and, uh, and it was a lot like I, so I co-wrote a lot of my early work with Lonnie Nadler, a uh, fantastic writer in his own right. And, uh, we, when we were at Marvel, like early on our third book at the publisher was, uh, the main title and an X-Men event, but we also had to come up with the infrastructure to support um, I think it was five other books and and also figure out what X-Men went on what team and where they were at every issue of every series. So like I had a spreadsheet with like 110 characters on it and then every issue of every series and like what was happening in all the columns. And it was like it was it was very intense. Like <laughs> And like, I, you know, we were kind of thrown into it early in our writing career and it was like a lot of learning on the fly and it was amazing i got to meet so many incredible other creators and and build a world with a bunch of really talented incredible people and it's like one of the best experiences i've ever had but it was like honestly like seven months of my life that are just a complete blur like <laughs> honestly like just yeah because it's like every day there's something new to look at every day there's something new to sign off on and it's like we were writing one book of six so but we had to look at everything that came in on all other books so it's like a normal marvel book almost always has a problem to solve every day there's something someone emails you ask a question whatever and then take that in time times that by six and you can kind of imagine um the volume of emails you're dealing with <laughs> now, wait, are you referring to age of x-men yes yeah okay see and look i'll be real sincere there was a there was a point in my life where unfortunately i wasn't reading the amount of comic books that i would have liked to it, like it became none for five to seven years and that kind of hurts my feelings and whatever i'm catching up all right <laughs> doing my due diligence but i will say when i seen that uh in what you were credited with i was like what's this because x-man is always a character that fascinated me because i mean it's cable without the techno or organic virus which means he can pretty much do whatever the hell he wants <laughs> yeah, yeah which which is kind of scary and and I, man, I'm, you all have like added so much crap I got to read just to be <laughs> one interview. I, 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 I need an editor for this show. If anybody out there watching knows how to like, <laughs> I'd have to explain so much shit to that person by the time it was all said and done. I'd be like, this is fucking pointless. <laughs> <laughs> be like, be like, you trying to be like, 
It's like, it'd be like you guys either trying to explain, hey, look, I need you to write this story. Or I need you to draw this for somebody. By the time you're done explaining, it's like, man, I should have just done that shit myself. <laughs> really should have. Would have taken less damn time, man. It really would have. But look, I want to let you all know out there watching, man, there are links in the description to a lot of things. Up to including Marvel <laughs> Unlimited. So you can go check out X-Men Unlimited 25 through 31. It's a uh, seventy-five through seventy-nine. Oh, why the, the hell did I see? I knew it was seventy-five. I don't know. Good, good. I was looking at the damn issue earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I literally was looking this up earlier. I don't know why I said twenty. I just wanted to like take fifty issues off the run in hopes that hey. I could catch up with everything. That's that's all it was, man. I was trying to, I was trying to pull back on the amount of crap that I need to read. <laughs> a nice guy, round number. They didn't. They didn't let it fly, man. They were like, "It's seventy-five. Get it right." <laughs> I'm sure issue twenty-five was great. Whoever wrote and drew that one, I don't have it off the top of my head. <laughs> uh, hey, no, we need Tom in the room for that because I almost guarantee he'd be like, "It was," and I'd be like, "I don't know how you do that, Tom. I don't. <laughs> I, I really bloody well don't." Right. So make sure you check out all the links in the description. Check out Phil. Check out Zach. There's a lot of dope work that they've they've done. There's a lot of things that we didn't even begin to get into. Like, I just got to say, before we kind of, before I do what I'm about to do, right, I just got to say, Zach, you wrote Ultimate Carnage or Absolute Carnage Avengers, right? Mm -hmm. Right. What would you think if I told you that I knew of a hip hop artist by, went by that went by the stage name Carnage, a.k.a. Cletus Cassidy? <laughs> I would be. Is it? I I have so many questions. <laughs> All right, look, we can get into that off air, but I swear to God, it's true, ladies and gentlemen. Right, I want to let you know if you've enjoyed this interview. Right, what I want you to do is I want you to send right Phil a mermaid, right. <laughs> Right? I do, yeah, yeah, no, I do love with, mermaids. With, so oh, much. damn it, where is it at? 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 Where is it, son of a bitch, man? Yeah, so many questions on this. Oh, with some Kenner's Superpowers collections, right? Cinema Mermaid with all kind of Kenner's Superpowers collections, just taking it to his door. I guess you're going to have to, like, show up in a pool. Like, you're going to have to bring him a pool on top of that. Otherwise, you're killing the mermaids. So don't sure, go kill the mermaids out there, right? Right? And to send Zach, okay, yeah, I want you to send Zach a Sasquatch, right? Okay. Right? Hold on, hold on. I got to find the, I got a man, I got, I have too many, I swear there's a website coming, y'all will be able to read the shit that I'm referencing here soon too. And you're like, this asshole takes, like he needs to highlight these or something. I really should. Um, it's a lot to deal with, right? What can I say? Wait, wait, wait. Where is it at? Man, did you not answer that question? You didn't answer all my <laughs> questions, Zach. You really did. No, I picked and chose what ones I wanted to Oh, oh, a Sasquatch? I, I didn't answer all of them either. <laughs> with the Batman animated series Batcave, right? There we Bat, go. Bat, right yeah, there, cool. right? Now, if you didn't like this interview, I want you to send the mystery man from Lost Highway to Zach and to Phil, <laughs> right? Right, to Phil. Well, I don't know if I answered that question. Man, Phil, just just send Phil. Did you could not, send me Bob from Twin Peaks. That scares the shit out of go. me. So yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> crawl through your bedroom. <laughs> oh jeez, yep. <laughs> Love David Lynch so much. Throws back at eyes. No, no, I I don't know if I can say it. Oh God, something just popped in my head. I don't even know if I should say it. <laughs> that probably shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> That's probably, probably true. Well, uh, I'll tell Phil that one after we wrap the show. But ladies and gentlemen, this has been The Questionnaire, right? Like, subscribe. Click all them links in the descriptions. There's all kinds, like I said, right? And do me a favor. Give it that thumbs up. Have a good night, y'all.